Well, hello, church family. We are back with video number 13 in our Psalms series, the Sacred Songs. We're going to be looking at Psalm 62 today, like they all are, a beautiful psalm, an incredible psalm. Can't wait to jump into it with you. I, I wish that you could see what I'm seeing from over here, because if you could, uh, on the laptop that's just out of your screen picture uh, right here, uh, that's the laptop that Josh uses to record all this stuff onto, and then he pulls it off and does all of his work and magic with it. But he's left on that laptop a picture of one of the little hand circles from the uh, circle game where you try to get people to look in the circle. And he's left that in the top left window. So he's probably gotten everyone who's coming to here to, to teach recently, and he can add me to the list uh, because that, that definitely got me. Uh, but puts a smile on my face as we jump into Psalm 62. And I'm glad that smile is there. It's a wonderful psalm. We're going to jump in together at verse 1, so grab your Bible or another device that you're not watching this on and, and join me in the Word, or you can see the words right up here on the screen beside me. Psalm 62, beginning in verse 1, the, Lord, the Word of God speaks to us this way, For God alone my soul waits in silence. From Him comes my salvation. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress I shall not be greatly shaken. You see, waiting for God's defense, his provision, his rescue, his word in silence is a scriptural theme to wit. Lamentations 3.26. It's good. It is a good thing. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Habakkuk 2.20. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silent before him. Exodus 14, 14, the Lord will fight for you. You have only to be silent. Zechariah 2, 13, be silent all flesh before the Lord, for he has roused himself from his holy dwelling. And in that verse and in ours, there's a picture of God coming forth in judgment. And that's exactly what the psalmist wants God to do. We'll see in judgment of whom in verses 3 and 4, and as we proceed through the psalm. But our Messiah, our King, Jesus Christ, the loudest voice in history, a voice that has continued to reverberate throughout the ages in power and majesty, no matter what people have tried to do to suppress that voice, he himself was silent before his accusers. Have you ever asked why? Isaiah 53, 7, he was oppressed and afflicted, but opened not his mouth. And like a lamb before the slaughter, like a sheep before the shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. And the image that we see here is this. We don't need to defend ourselves when God is pleading our case. And this is something that has led to uh, much frustration for me, but also great admiration, only frustration at times, but great affirmation of my dad who steadfastly throughout his ministry has refused to answer critics when the critics have spoken against him through gossip or duplicitously, like we'll see later on in this psalm. And we, I can't tell you how many times I've, I've tried to give him rash counsel to, to stand up to him, call a meeting, you know, whatever the case may be. And I think that my dad has always made the decisions that he's made based off of God's word. And he sees the truth of, of these passages, which is that the Lord fights for us. The Lord will plead the case of those with upright character, with integrity. And this word, uh, the Hebrew is dumia, is rendered as rest or stillness in other places. And recall what we saw in Psalm 46. And again, this is repetitive through the Psalms. Be still and know that I am God, we saw in Psalm 46. And I tell you what, here I stand. That's Martin Luther's uh, kind of famous quote, here I, here I stand, I can do no other. Um, more often than not, Folks, good, wise, strong, orthodox things should just be repeated and reemphasized. 
Like we don't have to always try to be too clever with God's word, always saying new things in new ways. We can just rest on the fact that God has spoken and just say things over and again. They don't lose their beauty. We don't have to dress them up in new clothes. The word of God is relevant. We don't have to make it relevant. Clearly the Lord going by verse 11, which we'll see later, doesn't have a problem with repetition. Once God has spoken, twice have I heard. That is a way, it's called a a step-up progression. That's a way of saying that I've heard this over and over and should hear it over and over again. And we'll see what he's heard later on. Verse 3, how long will all of you, this is who? The psalmist wants the Lord to to rise up in judgment against. How long will all of you attack a man to batter him? Like a leaning wall, a tottering fence. They only plan to thrust him down from his high position. They take pleasure in falsehood. They bless with their mouths, but inwardly they curse Salah. See, the wicked really don't change much, do they? I mean, a few psalms ago, we talked about how the the, the righteous person who will be blessed by God is one who looks out for the weak and the poor. But all the wicked want to do is tear them down and and tear them to pieces, uh, to, to, to drag them down. Here they are again, oppressing the weak and the feeble. Now, how did they do this? According to our text, they love dishonesty and they're duplicitous. They have a forked tongue. At least they, they say with one that what say one thing with their mouths that isn't reflective of what's in the heart. But notice that's seen by the psalmist. So it's not perfectly concealed. And we know that that can't be the case that it's perfectly uh, concealed because Christ tells us that from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Verse 5, for God alone, O my soul, wait in silence. The psalmist is imploring himself to wait on God and God's deliverance. For my hope is from him, from God. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. A repetition of what we saw in verse 1. Or verse 2, rather. Oh, on God rest my salvation and my glory, my mighty rock, my refuge is God. Let this be our declaration, Ridgeview Baptist Church. People of God, let this be our declaration. We wait upon the Lord. We hope only in the Lord. He is our rock. He is our fortress. He is our salvation. And let's say it again. Because that's what... The psalmist does. over. He wants to say the same things over and over again because they're worthy of being said. And they're worthy of being said as many times as they can be said. Verse 8, trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us, Salah. And the image here is that the Lord is a safe place, right? A harbor, a refuge in whom we can pour out our hearts without fear. And this is our deepest desire, Right? But no matter how close we get to anyone on earth, with whom, with whom else other than God can we feel comfortable revealing everything? And in God, we have that comfort, that assurance. He is our refuge, our hiding place. Verse 9, those of low estate are but a breath. Those of high estate are a delusion. In the balance they go up, they are together lighter than a breath. I love how Eugene Peterson renders this verse in the message translation. Um, I don't use the, the message translation to, uh, to parse from or, or necessarily to exegete from, but I love to go to the message just to see how Peterson and his pastoral wisdom has rendered a text. That's the only reason he did the translation. It wasn't to be a, a highfalutin, high and mighty, uh, scholarly translation. It was very pastoral and hard. He wanted to give his people the word of God in a way that they could clearly understand it that was also faithful to the original languages. So I do just use it for kind of a a look in from the outside of maybe seeing something a little bit differently. And I'm just going to share the way he renders verse nine on this next slide, because it's so beautiful. On the left side, we'll read the verse again. And then on the right side, we'll see how he renders it. So verse nine in the ESV, those of low estate are but a breath. Those of high estate are a delusion. So low and high estate, he's including everyone. 
Peterson's going to do that slightly differently. Uh, but the, the first are a breath, the second a delusion, and the balances, they go up, they together are lighter than a breath, and, and here's the way he renders that. Man as such is smoke. Woman as such is a mirage. Put them together, they're nothing. Two times nothing is nothing. Verse 10, put no trust in extortion, set no vain hopes on robbery. If riches increase, set not your heart on them. This is incredibly current uh, and applicable verse. Again, we don't have to make it palatable for this context that we're in. We just speak the truth. And because it's God's word, it never goes forth that it returns void to him. So try this on for size if we just want to use some, some modern examples. Don't trust Wolves of Wall Street. Never seen that movie, but supposedly it was about some guys who took advantage of a lot of other people and uh, did so by uh, extortion and uh, trading in an unethical way. So don't trust Wolves of Wall Street. Don't hope in Ocean's Eleven. The robbery, right? If you've ever seen that movie. Don't set your heart on the great Gatsby, on, on riches gained. Once God has spoken, twice have I heard this repetition, that power belongs to God, and that you, O Lord, belongs to you, O Lord, belongs steadfast love. For you will render a man to a man according to his work. God and his justice and his fairness and his equity renders to each according to their work. And that's a principle that's reaffirmed over and over again in the New Testament, chiefly in the verse, even while we were among you, we gave you this command. He who does not work should not eat. But I want to make a slightly different uh, point here, uh, a slightly different application with focus on uh, this, this verse 11 and the repetition there. I understand the critique of some modern worship music. I do. Specifically, because I love the hymns too. And I can specifically understand these critiques when it can be shown that the lyrics have departed uh, from being faithful to the Bible, from, from biblical uh, fidelity. But there's some of the critique of modern worship uh, music that I don't understand, and specifically, it's the criticism that it's repetitive. And I, I'm not saying that I've necessarily heard this from anyone at Ridgeview specifically. I've just seen this critique out there, and having served at now three churches, uh, two of which have achieved kind of blends where where worship is concerned, and one that was just much more traditional, I've seen this often as a, a criticism of, of modern worship music. And here's the deal, though. When you look at Scripture, God loves repetition. If it glorifies him, he loves it. Some examples. Revelation 4, 8, the angels aren't creative in their praises, right? Which they ceaselessly cry out before the throne. Holy, holy, holy. And they repeat it day and night forever. So those uncomfortable with repetition in song won't find heaven all that enjoyable. Jesus was fond of saying verily, verily, or truthfully, truthfully, or assuredly, assuredly, I say to you, to emphasize the trustworthiness of his word. If you want an example, John 8, 51. Jesus utilized repetition as he painted his masterpiece of the Beatitudes in Matthew 5. Blessed are, blessed are. Paul, Repetition, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice, Philippians 4, 4. And the Psalms are replete with repetitions and repeated utterances. Uh, and not to mention the early creeds were highly based off of repetition because they wanted those to be used for catechesis. So the training of young believers and to train someone, what's the easiest way to, to train is through repetition. Now, there have been other things that have been researched to, to show that it helps with learning, maybe more so than repetition. I, I, I'm not getting into all that, but I know this. Most of the time when I learn a verse of scripture, I'm learning it by repeating it in some way, shape, form, or fashion. And so though some uh, contemporary Christian music is, is worthy of critique, 
I don't know how how much of a foundation or a grounds we have to critique modern worship music based on its repetitiveness or its repetition. And all that beside, it's not like the great hymns are without their repetition. So just two cents there from uh, verse 11 that I, I think is uh, is certainly scriptural. So beautiful psalm. Uh, let me just go back to this declaration. Let this be our declaration, right? We wait upon the Lord. We hope in the Lord. He is our rock, our fortress, our salvation, and let us never fear to say it again. God bless you, church. We'll see you back here next time for what will be Psalm video number 14. That'll be on Thursday. Love you. Be safe out there.